criterion that you can see on the top right of, of the screen, usually found in sanctuaries. Also, moles and slugs were present at the site and suggest that metal production was taking place there. And there is a sequence of ritual depositions that starts in the 9th century BC, so still in the early Iron Age before the arrival of Aegean people, but continues, and we have many more of those kind of contexts in the 7th century. In Coronata was then abandoned at the beginning of the 6th century BC, and if we want to follow the trajectory of local communities after that point, we need to go further inland or to nearby Metaponto, which, which we will briefly do at the end of this section. We know from early Iron Age burials that women were consistently associated with, and thus likely involved in, specific activities. Foremost were rituals and weaving. Evidence related to both activities is present at Incoronata. So let us start with the earliest and most intriguing piece of evidence, and you can see it here at the bottom of the slide, which came from a layer that closed and obliterated the earliest phase of a large open air terrace paved with pebbles along the southern part of the Acropolis. And you can see it highlighted in the orange um, oval on, on the map. We do not know the entire extent of this, ter of this terrace, but it's circa 40 meters in length, uh, um, or that's as much as that has been excavated, while it is about eight meters wide. A second identical terrace paved with smaller pebbles was then rebuilt on top of this terrace during the 7th century BC, so in the moment of mixing with Aegean newcomers, likely in concomitance with the arrival of these Aegean migrants. The find that I want to talk to you about today consists of a small bronze bar pierced, pierced with a series of holes. It is part of a calcophone, uh, a percussion instrument found along the Ionic Gulf during the 9th and 8th centuries BC, so it ex exclusively dates to the early Iron Age. These instruments are found exclusively in the graves of adult women, and generally only one or two per generation. Moreover, they are always associated with the wealthier graves in the community. Another feature characterizing wealthy female burials, including those with calcophones, is the presence of pendants and chains that would have resonated with the movements of its bearer. Based on the prom prominence of the calcophones in elite women's graves, their rarity, the presence of other objects geared towards sound making, and the chronotypological evolution of calcophone that I'm not going to discuss here because we don't have time, it is possible to suggest that these objects were used in the context of ritual dances. Elite women with pendants, but without calcophones, would have participated by dancing and producing these kind of clinking sounds, while the woman with the calcophones, and again, there was maybe one or two per generation, would have led, led by providing the rhythm for the dance. Anthropologically, communal ritual, and in particular ritual involving music and dancing, have an important role in the creation of a sense of community. The fact that our, our in Coronata calcophone fragment uh, was found first intentionally broken, and this is something that happens to many objects that we find in ritual contexts across the site, and two, in a layer sealing a large paved open door terrace that was placed in the most public and prominent area of the site, may suggest, though of course it cannot be proven, that such a terrace would have been used precisely for this kind of ritual dancing dances. So, a very open space. Calcophones then stop being used, or at least they stop being found at the end of the 8th century BC, as contact with the Aegean was intensifying. Involvement of women in rituals, however, did not end, but may have definitely changed in nature. So in the 7th century phase of the site, the mixed phase, a series of ritual pits likely linked to ancestor cults are found across the northern, northern part of the site. They are characterized by pebble coverings and the deposition of intentionally broken vessel, vessels, both of Aegean and indigenous types, both imported and locally produced, produced uh, and these are mostly pouring and drinking shapes, but also cooking, and other objects. Single loom weights and spindle whorls are found deposited in this context too, indicating perhaps that women were actively participating in these rites. So here there is less emphasis in this case on status distinctions that women, as women across society would have been involved in weaving, weaving activities. Although when you symbolic, symbolically, such as in graves, and we do find like single loom weights or spindle worlds or sometimes combinations in, um, in graves also in the early Iron Age cemeteries of Incoronata, 
these finds tend again to be associated with wealthier burials. But one of the most interesting of these ritual contexts, which was deposited at the end of the use of the only non hypogeic structure of this phase, with the exception of the terrace, which also is not hypogeic, um, uh, is maybe the only context where weaving tools may also been, have been associated with high status. So this is an apsital building situated to the southeast of the ritual pits that have been found at Incoronata. And you can see it, it's sort of at the center above the, the large terrace. The ritual deposit found in the apse of the building was left in situ immediately before the building was ritually sealed and then the site abandoned. It included the cutout food of an amphora for pouring liquids into the ground, so it was stuck into the ground literally, and it would have been for libation. The fragments of one large Greek style mixing shape for wine and water, and the fragments of two indigenous drinking vessels. But next to them were also two weaving implements of a kind that is rarely found in burials, namely spools. These are associated according to Margarita Gleba's interpretation, to a particularly intricate, intricate kind of weaving called tablet weaving. Her hypothesis is that this technique was transmitted within the elite from mother to daughter, and that it served to mark the borders, borders of the dresses worn by the elite. Thus, one of the last actions in this area of the sanctuary before its closure was a last libation made with likely very intentionally chosen objects, which combined both Aegean culture indigenous culture and indigenous, indigenous elite women in particular. And here you can see the, the apsidal building, the whole uh, deposition as it was found, and there is an, a reconstruction of how tablet weaving would have, would have um, worked. And I need to go to the next slides now. So the site of Incoronata was abandoned immediately afterwards at the beginning of the 6th century BCE, a moment of great demographic territorial shifts in the region. Can I, can I go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so this brought about the structuring in a much more formal way of the colonial sites along the coasts. And this is a process that takes shape mostly in the 6th century and especially in the second half of the 6th century. Until then, so in the 7th century, colonial site had looked very much like in Coronata and other indigenous sites near the coast. They were spread out, non-nucleated settlements with mixed local energy and features. But from the beginning of the 6th century, public sanctuaries within the colonies and their surroundings start to appear, accompanied by Greek temple architecture and deposits of Aegean-looking figurines. So things really, really start to change. In Metaponto, the early urban layout is complete with, completed with the earliest evidence of a regular street grid, one at least partially constructed fortification wall, and one large structure for public assemblies, the so-called Icria. We know that the colonies, however, was not an Aegean enclave, but a mixed site with a large indigenous population, thanks to a recent bioarchaeological study which employed dental morphometric analysis to determine the biological distance of the local population to indigenous and Aegean samples. And the results were that the large part of the, of the population of the colony this, that we were able to analyze are actually have um, indigenous origins. At the same time, it is difficult to follow the traces of indigenous women into the colony to the fact that most excavations have focused on the architecture of the public spaces. So not, not much in terms of context. There are, however, clean signs of the, clear signs of the prominence of elite women in the city from the cemetery of Crucinia, where a group of exceptional graves was excavated. This contained a family nucleus with some very prominent female burials, while the grave goods that now are almost exclusively Aegean in type displayed the same preferential connections with Eastern Greece that are evidenced in the Aegean assemblage of, assemblage of Incoronata. Though still speculative, it is not difficult to imagine that the indigenous and Aegean population that had so successfully interacted in Incoronata moved to the coast and consolidated into larger, more structured settlements as territorial dynamics were becoming increasingly unstable, and there are many signs in the region of this kind of instability that I don't have a lot of time to get into right now. So within this complex, multifaceted process, it is clear that agency did not reside exclusively within adult male elite, but that, to the contrary, women's presence was preeminent and complementary to that of men. 
And this is perhaps not too surprising. Italic women's economic importance as producers and organizers of textile production has already been proposed by Margherita Gleba and others. Their possible roles as brokers in the early contact of, with foreign travelers through exchange, hospitality, and maybe also intermarriage has also been noted by Maria Suntacuazzo and Giovanna Bagnasco Gianni and others on the basis of early imports in women's burials and sanctuary assemblages. In addition, however, we would like here to note that there is both archaeological and written evidence from the 7th century, from 7th century Italy, that points to the increasing importance of emerging aristocratic kinship groups, which would have formed the first political building blocks of the early cities. Within this political framework, physical and spiritual reproduction of the kin group is of critical importance, and status is at least in part derived by proximity to a specific lineage. Within this framework, women, particularly those in the narrow circle of elite kings, important as reproducers, their involvement in rituals linking the living to ancestors and their potential for establishing new kin alliances through intermarriage should not be discounted. The centrality of certain women, as well as the importance of gender dynamics during this complex period, is also well attested in Western Sicily. Although most of the topics that I'm going to consider can be applied to other Sicilian sites, to keep on time, I'm going to focus only in the ritual politics of Polizello. This is a hilltop site located on a very strategic place, controlling the fertile lands and central Sicily, uh, the, controlling the fertile lands of central Sicily and the main roads to, that connect this area with the coastlands. You have here in the middle, in the western middle, Sicily. Following the same special organization that present most of the contemporary Sicily settlements, the topography of the hill is used to determine its main areas. Thus, as you can see in the slide, the cemeteries are located in the lower areas, at a second, as, at a second level, the habitat, and finally at the top of the hill, a communal ritual space, the so-called Acropolis, where communal ceremonies that entail, among other ritual practices, but if the positions and feasting practices, were celebrated periodically. The own, we can say then that the own physicality of the Acropolis and the successive celebrations carried out in them suggest that they are one of the main spheres of interaction within these settlements. They were meeting points, but also constant places of visual and mnemonic reference for everyone who inhabited in these spaces. Besides, the continuous celebration of communal ritual ceremonies turns the Acropolis into arenas where social solidarity was prompted and group identity was created. However, the heterogeneity of their participants, their different experience and social and cultural identities also turned the Acropolis into arenas where power relationships were constructed, negotiated, and materialized, but also gender politics. Indeed, a diachronic analysis of the Acropolis, mainly its space use and the nature of the material deposited in their different phases of use, allow us to approximate to this power and gender dynamics. Like most Sicilian Acropolis, the Polizellos one, present a complex architectonical history based on a sequence of quick and successive space reformulations, a constant alteration of the space through which different hegemonies were constructed and materialized, but also political, social, and gender relationships were fostered and legitimized. As you can see in this slide, during its first phases, the space of this Acropolis was quite open, with only a few structures on it. This openness enabled a considerable amount of people to attend the ceremonies, giving to the entire audience a high visibility over the different ritual practices carried out. Besides, the attendance mobility was quite flexible. This open and inclusive space seems to strengthen the collective character of these celebrations, in which all those who belong to these communities independently of their social positions and gender, were admitted, participating directly or mainly indirectly in most of the ritual activities carried out in these celebrations. This inclusive character is also highlighted through some objects ritually deposited here. 
Although at this moment, ritual depositions were still scarce, most of the objects deposited are related to collective practice, mainly the feastings. In this sense, it stands out the deposition of a fragment goblet along with three lithic objects on, on the hearth of Polizello structure E. Being one of them a sharp object that can be related with the sacrifice and dismembering of an animal that could be consumed during the ceremony collectively. Along, the, uh, along with it, it's also interesting to consider the presence of some kungware in different Acropolis areas, a recipient largely associated with the feminine sphere, and whose presence in this space suggests the active participation of certain women in the celebrations. In fact, during this first moment, contemporaneous to the establishment of the first colonies on the island, both, of, both the space and the material recorded in the Acropolis suggest the celebration of collective ceremonies of inclusive nature. They don't seem to allude to the individuality of the participants explicitly, but as members of the different houses understood them in its wider sense that conformed these settlements. However, the, centripet uh, the centripetal nature of that characterized the first period seems to dissolve over time, especially from the end of the 7th century and throughout the 6th century. This is a moment that coincides with the beginning of the expansive projects that present some Greek colonies in the island. Regarding the use of the space, it should be noted the construction of new buildings on the Acropolis. This increase of the built environment entails a decrease of the number of participants that can assist to the celebrations, but also a reduction of, the, of their visibility over some of the practices carried out there, and even the inaccessibility to those developed inside the new constructions. Besides, this new spatial order would also constrain the mobility of the assistants, perhaps establishing a specific place for them. Indeed, this new use of the space suggests the emergence of a much more strat stratified society, or at least to a society in which individuality is more emphasized. This new paradigm is also illustrated by the nature of the objects deposited at this moment. One of the main architectonic changes from this moment is the structure B, located in the north area of the Acropolis. This is a circular building with an internal bench and a possible altar. Besides, it stands out the presence of a central hearth. This is a new feature because in the earlier stages, hearth were only documented around the central structure and in some open spaces. Another interesting aspect from this structure is the presence of 17 ritual depositions. Although most of the deposited, uh, deposited objects still allude to fe feasting practices, stand out the presence of personal ornaments, as well as weapons and objects related to war practices. Two, king, two kind of objects scarcely attested in the early stages of the Acropolis. It should be noted that weapons, mostly spare hairs, but also arrow hairs, daggers, and horn hands, a possible shield, shield and a helmet, are recorded in eight of the 17 of these depos depositions. This emphasis on the military sphere seems to be strengthened when we consider the deposition of a small terracotta figurine representing an uh, Italophallic uh, warrior with helmet and shield close to the altar. To these objects closely related to the male sphere must add the presence of two agriculture tools, especially an iron hoe and a sickle, as well as a bronze, bronze figurine that represent a male of error. The nature of these depositions could indicate that at this moment, certain members of this community, especially men related to the agriculture labor, but mostly to war practices, participated in these communal ceremonies independently, inside the structure B. In this space, they would carry out their own feast and ritual actions, as well as they would promote a new masculinity based on the land and the war. <coughs> Simultaneously to the establishment of this homosocial space, 
the southern area also suffered some changes. In this area, all the activities seem to be concentrated around a structure D, which was reformulated through the introduction of internal bench and the construction of a, rect a rectangular annex that seemed to act as a porch of access. As we have seen in the structure B, in both the spaces were located a hearth in which were recorded remains from small animals, mainly hares. <coughs> the first was associated to the cooking surface, while the second, within the porch, to a grinding stone. These are two elements widely documented in contemporaneous household contexts, both related with the elaboration of everyday food products. Moving to the material recorded in this structure, stand out, again, based related to drinking practices, but the nature of the deposited objects here differs from the ones recorded before in the structure B. In this case, stand out personal ornaments like bed, uh, beds, bits, pendants or fibulae, some of them carefully deposited inside some bases and even a small wooden chest. Along with these materials, in this structure were also documented astrogals, some lamps, not recorded in the structure B, and a considerable amount of loom weights. Regarding, regarding the later, stands out the deposition one, composed by one lamp, one, an iron knife, some astrogals, and 10 loom weights. The different materials recorded in this space suggest that, as it happens with the structure B, during the communal ceremonies, certain members of the community carried out some ritual practices independently. In this case, it's quite possible that certain women gathered in this space where they celebrate feasting practices that entailed the intake of some beverages, the consumption of smaller animals, and probably also some foods elaborated with cereals. But during this segregated celebration, they also emphasize a new, feminine, uh, a new femininity, in which personal ornaments and, and certain domestic activities, such as the production of food and the manufacture of textiles, were also important. To conclude, I only want to uh, highlight that through this diachronic analysis, we can suggest that throughout these centuries, the Sicilian people move from a world that, despite the existing social, political, and gender differences, wanted to emphasize an image of cohesion, to another that, although not forgetting the communal ideals, reproduced a new world understanding, a world based on the individuality and the difference among those who belong to this community, especially those related to gender. In fact, as the later stages from Polizilla illustrate, a world where some men and women use these communal celebrations to construct, negotiate, and legitimate their new social positions, as well as their, uh, their masculinities and femininities. Through much detail, still needs to be fleshed out, what emerged from comparing these two cases, to these two case studies, is a clear sense that the society and economy at large was undergoing deep changes, which accelerated and intensified in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. So, were gender roles changing and adapting in response? Rituals in village communities in the early Iron Age, both in Sicily and southern Italy, took place in open spaces. And even if both gender and status difference were incorporated within these practices, participation was in all likelihood open to all. As contacts with newcomers intensify, new opportunities, ideas, and resources would have come into play and unsettled previously held balances, allowing for greater emphasis on social distinctions particular status in its intersection with gender. Closed, displays, uh, closed spaces, like those in Polizello and in Coronata, were created in this later period, allowing for separation and distinction between community members. This is one step further in the direction of more structured hierarchical settlements, whether in the Sicilian hinterland or in the colonies of Man Magna Grecia. Thank you so much for your comprehension and patience.
and I, we hope to see you someday soon.